Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of The Soccer Scene um, with myself, Hedron Finnan, and joined once again by Noel O'Connor. And this evening, a special guest and former Galway United uh, chairman in Bernie O'Connell. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening, Bernie. Uh, yeah, great to be with you, Adrian. I'm um, honoured to be uh, part of the Sporting Lisbon, uh, Sporting Limerick uh, podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're unfortunately we don't have the same quality analysis as maybe some of the sporting Lisbon um uh, analysis. So um, we, you might have to bear with us on that one. But I suppose um just to, to start really, uh, Bernie. Obviously, as I mentioned at the the top of uh, the introduction, you've been involved with with Galway United for many years. I believe both in a reporting sense and obviously uh, within the club as well. So your association stretches long back. Well, it does in many respects. Um, I was a follower, I suppose, from day one. Um, many people, I grew up in an era when the League, League of Ireland football wasn't a reality in Galway and people thought it would, it never would come. So when we went in in 77, I was as enthused as anybody and uh, it was a great, uh, great uh, addition to the fabric of sporting life in Galway to go up the Dyke Road on a Sunday afternoon. And um, he... It had its charm, and there was a you know people loved the novelty of a great crowds, great and great enthusiasm. I'd say for a few years we were kind of very much in the all star ends, but uh, a man of great 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 service to Limerick, uh, John Herrick, I think was instrumental in kind of changing that because after about two or three years uh, we he, he brought us to a league cup final, which we were unlucky enough to lose on penalties in Dundalk, and the genesis of. Uh, uh, the, the Galway kind of arriving to becoming a serious club, I think, was started there in the mid 80s. Then Tom Lally brought us to a cup final, Tony Mannion the following season got a second in the league. And I think that was our golden era. era. So within 10 years of uh, arriving into the league, we had our, we had our um, major moments twice in Europe. Um, okay, we went on to 91 when we won the cup. And that gave impetus then, I think, to maybe the transformation of Terry Lamb Park, which was huge for us in that, um, uh, you know, we, we changed the ground and made it into a stadium, um, you know, one that was, um, we used comparable to anything that I think that was, that was in the league. People like playing there. Emma Deese, you remarked to me that, well, look, he says, the problem with that is everybody loves coming to Terry Lamb. One time he says, clubs would love to come down and... Uh, uh, they only wanted to get out without having injuries. Now they were leaving injuries, he says, and taking the points with them. So that didn't suit him. And, and um, <laughs> probably, uh, as with a lot of things, there was a, there was a fair element of truth there. But uh, I think Eamon's time for me, uh, before we got into the League of Ireland, I remember Eamon playing for Limerick in the Cup Final in 77. And the thing that really got to me that day in uh, Daily Mount was Eamon being the first uh, player that, that, that Limerick lads chanted for. And I could see the way that he had um, gotten into the hearts of Limerick uh, soccer followers. And uh, I think that probably gave him the lift to say, look, I could be really serious at that. And he set his stall out to go to England and Aston Villa and uh, winning the league with that 14-man squad and playing in Europe subsequently and then coming home. And I suppose if you were to give John credit, uh, John Hurry credit, uh, a, a member of that 77 team uh, for Limerick. You'd have to give Eamon's return in the mid 80s as a as a huge fillip to Galway. That if Eamon was coming home and wasn't paid for his services because he didn't want it that way, and uh, the arrival of Joe Hanley as chairman for the club and the change from Galway Rovers to Galway United, and then it led to kind of heady days. And I was lucky enough at those times to start reporting for the Galway Advertiser. From that, I went on to uh, do Galway BFM when it was there in its early days. And um, uh, I was also involved in the early 90s in the transformation of Terryland. So I have very fond memories of that in that there were great communal efforts to kind of change the face of Galway soccer. And subsequently, I was deemed an independent as I was reporting. There was a three-pronged committee of Galway United, Galway FA and Independence. I was independent, but subsequently I got involved with Galway United, first as secretary and um, later on then the club um, went out of business. And I was with uh, a group of people who came together to, to refound the club, following the report of Ned O'Connor uh, for the FAI. And... That was tricky because Salter Devil and Murphy were in it, and the Galway FA were also members. And 
In fairness, uh, Murphy and Salte uh, withdrew and Galway United came back. But first it's Galway FC and then Galway United and the Coma brothers came in to support the club and really that has been a huge, huge uh, aspect of Galway United still being vibrant even when they hit bad days. The Comas were there to support them and uh, try to tease it up like the difficulty of keeping the full-time team going as as you know yourselves yeah. in yeah. Limerick and you know keeping League of Ireland going. Limerick Galway have experienced it. There's highs and lows but it's just important to keep going and um, we look forward to the game of Treaty. You know it's a, it's a great match and there's a bit of spice in involved in it because of the amount of Galway players who are um, uh, playing with Treaty now and you know, giving them great service, and they always come back to you know, DC Park or Marcus Field with a point to prove, and um, that's proper order, that's that's only right and fair. And um, it would be a fool who think that there's any that there's any likely outcome to that. That's a game that could go either way because you you, you always sense that lads like in the corner, Mark Ludden, they, they give it 150% when they play against Galway because it's that's in their um. That's in their in in their blood. They're competitive guys, and um, you know they have a point to prove. And sure, look, would you ask for anything else on a Friday night? Absolutely not. And it's funny you say it. I think Noel he's he's really downplaying uh, Galway United there because they'll definitely be favourites in Eamon DC Park on Friday night. But I suppose just to go back to your own points. You mentioned the likes of Eamon DC, who's a legend. The ground is now named after him as well, uh, Bernie. And you mentioned you know the start in '77, the cup finals. Uh, with Galway. There's obviously trials and tribulations like you said as well. We know that uh, in Limerick and it's been the same for Galway um, into the la- at the start of the last decade uh, as well. I suppose what's your your highest point or what was the most memorable point uh, that you can uh, name uh, being involved uh, with Galway and supporting Galway over the years? Well, personally uh, you know, I had an involvement in, in bringing them out to Carroll for the, the 86 uh, uh, European match uh, so I used to work uh, as an Irish teacher in Irish colleges in Nankararua, and um, I, I knew that the pitch there wasn't, uh, it, was a, it was a community pitch, it wasn't attached to the GAA, so I knew that there was a possibility there, and whilst we played in the sports ground in 85, that wasn't available to us in 86, so I, I, I brought Joe Hanley out to show him the ground, and you know, subsequently Aidan Gallagher came down from for the FBI and, and, and uh, UEFA, and past the ground, so I, I looked at it as a, as a great memory. I'd say the reopening of the uh, of Terryland was a huge thing, and following three or four very hard years of work. Indeed, Michael D was the minister for the Wales up to the remember he gave us a grant for 18k, which doesn't look a huge sum now, but you, you might might be worth about maybe five, six, seven times the money at that point, and that enabled us to, to get that through. That was that was a huge moment. Obviously, winning the cup in '91 was huge. And then some years ago, when uh, things were, were pretty low for Galway, um, I, I got a group of people together to have a project which was known as Reclaim the Dyke. Because, as I said to you, the, the games started on a Sunday afternoon uh, in 77, and people used to walk up uh, the Dyke Road to the matches, and you'd have the carob on your left, and you know, you're almost going into the countryside. But people walked to the matches and we decided we'd start a season like this. Now, at the same time Alan Murphy was appointed, we were in the first division, we were embedded into it, we'd never gotten out, but he had only really a team of youngsters. Now, again, a great Limerick lad, Dara Costello was playing for us. He's with Bradford on loan from Burnley. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, a great talent, Johnny Higgins, who was with uh, UCD, and Cole Kelly, who was down with Treaty. So, the kind of circle and all that, like, you know, all roads either lead away from Galway back to Limerick or it's in the other direction. But we had a, a wonderful night that night where we just walked up the Dyke Road and the president was with us again. And uh, I think we had about 2,000 people and the biggest first division crowd outside the playoffs, I think, for many for many seasons. Now, last year, uh, in fairness to Cork, they had huge crowds in the Turners crowd across. We had the biggest crowd, I'd say, Last year, when we played Cork at the end of the first series, since I'd say Sunderland was there, when Roy brought them over in, let's say, the maybe 206 or, or something like that, around that time, or maybe a little earlier, 204. So, those are the nights that you could that you remember. Those are the things that, you know, the redevelopment of Amadisi Park or Thailand 
that meant a lot to me. But there was other kind of things on the way. And I, I was chair when we got promoted um, in in um, as OESC, and, and that that was probably the biggest honour. I remember two great Shelburne guys, uh, the chairman uh, Joe Quinn and Shea Weaver. And the graciousness when, when when we beat them, I think in the semi final of the playoff, and the way that they addressed that, and for the way their own personal disappointment came over to me, I learned an awful lot about sport that night. In terms of, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I mean, they so disappointed and so upset. And thinking back to were there to square one, and Shells have been a long, long time in the in in the first division. Had a good team, put a lot of investment into it. So, you know, you, you think of these things, and um, you know, there's. There, there are good days, but they're sandwiched between an awful lot of heartache and disappointment, and um, you know things not working out as you hope they will, and maybe being you feel let down by the face or let down by people or whatever it is. But uh, you can't, you know, you can't really. You don't go into it for the big days. You hope you get them, but you know, provided I think in a League of Ireland context, you. You put out a good team. You pay your bills. You you, you provide something for the public. You, you 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 let people dream and hope. And again, that there's no there's nothing, you know, catching up with you afterwards. That itself is an achievement. And I think, you know, at the start of every season, there's what eight ten teams going to post in the first division. You know, there can only be one winner. There might be one other team going up. But it doesn't mean to say that the other six or seven teams that the managers or the committees or boards have done bad jobs, you know, but the, you get stick like it from supporters, etc. Like the Marcus Field last year when we lost to Waterford, it, you know, there was great disappointment. There was the episode with the stand. Uh, yeah. We did well, but we, you know, we were beaten by three goals and you can't say yeah. everything. Again, there was a disappointment. I was very upset by the, you know, the way that our crowds or some of our crowd turned on Job Coffee. And I found that very upsetting, and you know, I thought it was so, uh, you know, ill-deserved. But you know, fate, supporters, results, things like that are fickle, you know. Football supporters can be very fickle, Noel. And I know that when we were discussing that the end of at the end of season, we thought similar to Bernie that it would the the abuse. That, that John Caulfield, I suppose, endured on the night was was a bit over the top, to, to say the least. Um, you know, people seem to forget it was an incredibly competitive first division. So just because Galway had put resources into it definitely didn't necessarily mean you were going to get out of the division, but that seemed to be the way that supporters uh, thought. Well, it's that, that was the case. And, um, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I've known, I suppose, Nearly every manager that managed Galway United, and I, you know, I, I'm absolutely convinced in John's professionalism and his integrity and his will, will to win. I think he's absolutely wonderful. I'm not apologising to any man for having that opinion. I accept that people can have other opinions, but you know, I'm retired now, and I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm, it's possible for me to go and watch them train regularly and uh, watch the preparations and you know, first class. And um, you know, I, I I'm I'm really happy. I, I want I wanted to do well. Bringing Ali in with them is a is a big thing. And all that kind of passion that he he stores up, I think it'll be it'll be great. But there's great football knowledge and there's great um, chemistry between the two of them. So you'd hope that that might be the the extra dimension. But you, you know, like you know, one game plays. It's 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 it's, it's not at the time to be making for uh, predictions or anything like that. Yeah, certainly. There has been a huge amount of bite in the game that you referenced earlier on between uh, Galway and Tweed over the last couple of seasons, Bernie, obviously because of the crossover of players uh, in particular. You have uh, three, well, two former Treaty players in the squad in Ed McCarthy and uh, currently injured at Callum McNamara, who was signed in pre-season. And obviously as well, Killian Bruder, who signed... Um, I suppose all the way back when Limerick FC were, were going uh, out of business effectively. Um, how are those uh, three players, in your opinion, getting on uh, with Galway? I suppose particularly McCarthy and Bruder, who you have seen. You probably haven't seen much of Callum McNamara. No, I haven't seen Callum play, but I, I couldn't I couldn't praise uh, Ed McCarthy or, or um, Kelly Bruder enough. I think they're wonderful human beings, great, great lads, and they're a huge addition to any dressing room. Epitome of honesty and real kind of commitment to it. They seem to be very happy in the club and you know I I I I 
you know, I watched them both this morning and, you know, they're there, they're present, they're about their business. And uh, I think the full time setup kind of suits them or, you know, satisfies their their their, their ambitions. But uh, um, they're great lads, absolutely first class. And, um, you know, I see Conor ba Barry has joined uh, Treaty this year and there was a guy that I had huge time for as when he was a student and, his career kind of is, you know, he's kind of meandered a little bit, but he's a lovely player, lovely, skillful on the ball. So I think he'd be an addition to to, to Treaty this season as well. But um, if if Callum does the same job as the other two lads, Bob, we are blessed. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that still remains to be seen. Just to bring yourself in there, Noel, um, I know that Bernie was speaking about the the Terryland Park uh, redevelopments and Amy DC Park, as it's now known as, um, uh, for for the younger uh, viewers here. But we remember this Terryland Park. Um, you, you had many a battle yourself, Noel, in in Terryland Park over the over the years. But I suppose it's great to see now what it's turned into because I do remember watching uh, the I think it was the FAI Cup semi final between Galway and Finn Harps in 1999, and and it's the ground was it was kind of almost wide open. Now you've got two uh, very uh, I suppose state-of-the-art type stands in um, in DC Park. So that's uh, there's been huge improvements on that front uh, in Galway. Yeah, listen, it's great to listen to, to Bernie. You can listen to him all night, uh, in fairness. And, you know, the, the way that the love he has for his club. And uh, I was particularly delighted to hear him back in John Caulfield because I'd be a big fan of John's myself. And I think he's doing a really good job. Um, I was upset myself leaving the Marcus Field after that playoff game. And you knew that because the two of us were at that game. Together, um, I rang a, a great Galway man that night in Patrick Dolan and I just couldn't kind of believe the carry-on of the Galway supporters. I spoke to a few of them on the way out as well and I just felt there was there was no talk, talking to them. But uh, my first away game, uh, I was brought to Terryland Park. It was about 1980. Uh, my neighbour, Jim O'Donnell of O'Donnell Engineering, he was a big Limerick uh, fan at the time and it was the first away match that... That I went to so and obviously look it was always it's a bit of a local derby I know it's not the same province but it's it's nearer to um to Limerick than than Carcass you know so th there's always been a little battle there and um it was always been tough I certainly remember my battles with Tony Mannion in, in the early 2000s as well um Galway were a real handful uh, on under Tony Mannion and I certainly learned a lot from him as well yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, Bernie, looking ahead to this game between uh, Treaty and Galway at m and Park on, on Friday, um, looking at it in an overall sense with the league, I think Galway will be favourites going into the game, although all these games seem to only be settled by the odd goal. That's 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 for sure. There were some really big battles between the sides last year, including Galway's big comeback at the Marks Field when they were 2 nil down and um, 1-3-2, which was a pivotal result for them. Um, I know we were speaking about Oli Horgan going in with John Caulfield and looking at the squad now and maybe looking at the likes of Waterford, even though they have started really well, losing Phoenix Patterson and Junior Quaterna. Um, I suppose, you know, the league title, that'll be de they'll be desperate to get their hands on that in Galway. And obviously the attendances show that because the attendances have been uh, huge up. The appetite is certainly there to get Premier Division football back to Galway. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, what, what we've learned is we've gone into playoffs uh, three years in a row and come out empty handed so you really have to go in the front door and um, you know win, win the, the league you, you certainly don't spurn at it but if somebody said to me you know what do you want to win the thing or to get promoted is promoted is the, is the, is the issue um, I think you know the investment that the Comers have put into it and the, the full time set up I suppose there is a kind of a uh, you know a kind of an ambition and uh, you know a will that if, if at all uh, humanly possible sporting wise you, that you that you play start to get uh, the chance to play premier football but that's true of every team that goes out and really you know the favorite thing i don't put any store in because you know after after that great comeback from galway we played um treaty in in in, in MDC park and it was the night before uh, stephen walsh's wedding and you know Lads like Conor Wayne and uh, Mark Lodden and well, those two in particular be great friends of Stephen. And you know when when the ball was kicked off, like that was it. And uh, you, the the focus of the Limerick lads, uh, you know, on the treaty jury was absolutely first class. They weren't out there except to represent treaty, and they, they were they were magnificent in it. And they got with all the ball and all the possession and all the chances, but there was no concession and. Um, 
don't expect anything any different. You know, you know, we'll have much slimmer teams as as far as I I, I can remember. And uh, even minded too, to talk about eighty five there, it was that game between replay game between Limerick and uh, Galway United that which Galway got to the final in, but that gave Galway its tickets to Europe. So in, in many respects, both player wise and club wise and almost history wise. There's huge similarities between the clubs and the same kind of ambition between them. And uh, possibly say that the junior game in, in Limerick is that bit stronger and has its own uh, pull. Whereas I'd say you could argue that maybe the junior game in Galway isn't as strong. It's interesting now that, um, again, it's a, it, there's one, only one Galway club left in the last eight of the FAI Junior Cup, and that's... Uh, uh, a country team which which shows like that the big powers like Marview and Salt Hill, uh, which you might have expected because their League of Ireland experience yeah. that they haven't they haven't backed it up as well. Whereas like you certainly know what you, you feel always that Limerick Junior Soccer had that kind of um, traditional lore and uh, you know that that, that that it really really is big with people there and a great following and great support for it. I find the Galway Junior game is great, is great, and there's the, the amount of clubs that are involved, uh, men's and women, is terrific. But I don't know where, you know, I, I want a better judge than myself to say, well, what's what the standard of it is like, you know. Um, I'm also, I remember before Galway went into the League of Ireland, who, who Galway won the, uh, the Oscar trainer in 1971. It's a long time since 1971 without having an Oscar trainer. No fellas would point out they went to about five finals and lost. But you know, you, you'd like to win another one uh, sometime soon. Absolutely. And I suppose just on a final note, uh, with you on, on with us, uh, Bernie, uh, what was uh, really, I suppose, uh, uh, brilliant to see last weekend was the the attendances at all League of Ireland grounds, uh, to be fair. I know that, unfortunately for us in, in Limerick, we were the only ones not to break the 1,000 uh, mark uh, of attendance. But, you know, there was a few sold out grounds. I think there was over 30,000 people in attendance at League of Ireland matches. Um, so it the game here does appear to be growing uh, bit by bit. Well, yeah, I, I, a bit my, I, 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 I certainly know that kind of Galway United's uh, post COVID attendances are, are are huge, and 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 that's true. And I think COVID had a lot to do with it. And the thought of the value, like of, of of the value of actually being out and supporting our own teams, and you know all that. Like I don't mind any person following a team in England. And good luck to them, but they, you know they almost a craven way where, you know, people see themselves as soccer followers but wouldn't even think of going outside the door to support their local team. I mean, I, I find it difficult to, you know, to, you know, to be in in company with people like that. The, the, you know, the essence of sport, I think, has been involvement and you support your own, you know. I know in my household, like, it's Galway and Treaty on Friday night and it's Galway and Limerick and the Hurling on Sunday and you go and you support and... You enjoy it all, whether it's the rugby, the soccer, or the Gaelic. You, you go out and you support because it's your own, and I think that's possibly coming back. And you know, I give credit to some of the Dublin clubs, and that that you know that they they have a much more community orientation to the way that they put their product out there. But I also think it's the work of the clubs themselves. Um, the FEI, you know, are how would I say they 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 they're, they're delighted with it, but. I'd, I'd give all that credit to to the to the clubs themselves, rather than to would say the national organisation, which yeah. still isn't robust enough, I think, to actually go out and do that. Indeed, you know, it had the community officers from when I was secretary twenty years ago, and you know, if they, they had a designated guy in there trying to uh, trying to build up the club, it'd be hard to do that again. But you know, credit to the people who are getting the people in. The atmosphere at games is better. The, the 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 sense that it counts amongst people is, is, is important too, and um, you know uh, again too I suppose we talked about grounds in different times to go to the Marcus Field now to go to MDC Park is a far better experience like than the times that Noel and I referenced this evening, and um, you know long may that continue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to have you on the show with us, Bernie, and get your insight uh, into everything. Um, I suppose the only thing I will say is I hope you're not in a good mood come quarter to ten on uh, Friday evening and that three they are taking home the points down the M18. Well, we will reach, we will reach hope otherwise, but uh, I'm certainly not counting on any chickens or no chickens have hatched here in Galway on that one. 
Right. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Chad. Good night, Bernard. No one. No, um, no, O'Connor, um, myself and yourself left to, to mull over uh, the League of Ireland action from last weekend and, of course, coming up uh, this weekend. Obviously, no, 3D United lost out 1 0 to Bray Wanderers. To be honest with you, no, it looked, it was an even enough game. It looked as if it was heading for a draw when it got to that late stage. Ben Feeney gets a goal. I, I have to apologise actually to Mark Ludden because I wrote in my report that it was Mark Ludden that uh, made the mistake for the goal with a header at the back post. It was actually Anthony O'Donnell who miscued the header and Jake Walker put it back across the box and Ben Feeney was waiting in there just to score um, the, the winning goal, which Bray were, were, went into jubilation uh, mode at that stage like to get a winner in, in that fashion. I suppose, Noel, what did you make of the overall performance from, from 3D United on the night? Yeah, it was. I think it was a typical first game of the season. Um, particularly the first half, you know, there was there wasn't a lot of football. There was a lot of long balls. Bray were trying a lot of diagonal balls as well, and um, you know, you wouldn't expect a lot. Like in in terms of play, our teams and players, you know, they'll probably need to get a few games under their belts. Um, a top break play played quite well overall. Um, it was a typical Ian Ryan show in terms of their their passing. Thought they were nice and quick and bright overall. A lot of triangles. And, you know, there was a good bit of movement there. They certainly create a lot of problems for, for Treaty on their left and Treaty's right. Got a few passes, you know, in between the, the full back and the centre half. As Tommy said, they didn't really test the keeper, but uh, I thought the Treaty were working very hard to stay with them. Um, there was a lot of blocking and tackling and chasing and harrying done, like, because they did kind of dominate the ball. Um, I had to give him credit because they kept going, they kept playing, playing that way. He he made a few good changes, I thought. Brought on a few players that impact like Luka Lovic and uh, as you mentioned, uh, was it Ben Feeney came on late yeah. as well. And uh, you know they kept playing the way that that he wants them to play, and uh, they probably got the reward. It's a very big win for them. I think it's a big win for Ian Ryan as well. Um, obviously despite how well he's done, say, particularly last year, um, certainly had a bit of an issue with with Treaty and um, they found it very hard to win games. And, you know, it, it certainly will get, give them a big boost. Um, it's hard to really judge, you know, it's one game. I'm sure Treaty are very disappointed. They certainly had a few chances as well. Mm. And uh, on another day, they probably could have got a draw or even a win. And look, we've seen it, but certainly... It didn't happen, and it's certainly not going to get it any easier on uh, on Friday night. Yeah, certainly not, Noel. Um, I suppose just that there was a twenty minute period, Noel, in the second half where Treaty were probably on top. Um, you know, the the standout player for Bray, uh, in my opinion, and many people's opinion on the night was Cole a more a young one. Uh, excuse my pronunciation, but he was the standout player. I felt, and he made a crucial block when Alex Moody flapped that across when Conor Barry looked all but set to put the ball in the net. Uh, that was a big chance. Obviously, Lee Devitt had a good chance in the first half as well. He drew a good save uh, from Moody. But I felt, Noel, once Treaty probably didn't score in that 20-minute period, I didn't think they were actually going to lose the game, but I did think it was a case of they weren't going to win the game at that stage. Um, so, you know, that that did, in that period of that two to three chances that they did have, uh, they just obviously failed to capitalise by putting the ball in the net. Yeah, and I was watching the match with, with Sean O'Shea of Farley Wexford, and I think he might be doing a bit with Bray now. And I asked him, how did you pronounce... Uh... Cole's second name and he just said look the lads just call him Cole so I'm going to do the same <laughs> thing and just call him Cole but I thought he was absolutely outstanding all, all during the game I haven't seen a more dominant performance by a centre half I think he won everything in the air um, you spoke about his block he got another one in straight away I think nearly yeah, or he did either just before after. or just after mm -hmm. that one um, he looked a real threat from set pieces arrived late in the first <laughs> half for a header at the back post just kind of ran out of pitch and um, I thought he took a really good yellow card as well, say, when Bray were defending their lead um, in, in the last few minutes of the game. Uh, signed from Shamrock Rovers was an under-19 last year. Ian Ryan looked to get him on loan with Wexford uh, in the window last year and didn't get him, but they've signed him now. And, you know, to me, he looks like a really, really good sign and a guy that has a, has a big future. 
Yeah, absolutely. I know that with the treaty team, maybe one or two surprises. No, you know it's the first night of the season, so it's hard to, to uh, judge anything. Ryan, the Ryan Connolly situation would have changed uh, a lot, I suppose, in in a short period of time. But Stephen Christopher, I did actually think that Ben O'Reardon would play a lot more at centre back this year because of maybe the lack of options, particularly you now with Mark Walsh being in midfield. Um, he did play centre back next to Anthony O'Donnell. Um, on Friday night, Stephen Christopher played at right back. I don't think they did uh, particularly much wrong. And this time he said Chris Lyons was taken off after maybe seventy five minutes or so. So as you said, they were working hard to to keep them out. Um. I suppose the one concern you'd have maybe was is midfield now, but in saying that, I suppose Alec Byrne from Cork City has signed and all that will that will surely help uh, some bit as well because you know Colin Conroy is so young he's probably going to be in and out of the team before he ever gets a consistent run uh, at it as well, isn't he? Yeah, look, I think I was kind of surprised by a few positional um, placements on the pitch myself. I thought it was. An unusual one to see Stephen Christopher right back. I thought actually that Ben O'Reardon would play there. And I know initially when he came in last year, it was like he was a replacement for, for Charlie Fleming or when Jack Lynch wasn't available to play there. Um, and I thought they had issues there in the first half, although obviously it didn't uh, result in a goal. But a lot of a lot of attacks came down that, that side and they were able to pass the ball through, if you like. There seemed to be a big gap between the right side of the centre half and, and Stephen Christopher. Like, you know, in, in those situations, you probably need to to narrow in a little bit, but like not having a lot of game time as a full back, you know, those little subtle things um come to the fore. Um, I thought he would play Ben Reardon right back and Mark Walsh centre back. In fairness to Anton O'Donnell, you know, he might have had two goals from, from set plays. No, you talk about the error at the end, but look, I, I think he'll be a great addition back. Look, and he's been out for a year. Um, he looks like a guy that's going to score a lot of goals from corners. Um, that was encouraging, wasn't it, Noel? Because we all know yeah, he scored six was, goals yeah. in 2021, yeah. but that was really encouraging. Yeah, there was one real chance. That, like it, I think he just headed over the bar, did he? And I think, look, yeah. if, if, if it was a few games in or maybe he was playing all last year, I, I think he certainly would have scored that. Um, the midfield as well. Um, my memories, if you like, of Conor Barry is, is a guy playing in the middle. Like He's kind of a very polished midfielder. Thought he, he might have played as a number 10 behind um, Ender Kern. And, you know, obviously out of possession would be a third midfielder. Um, but look, that's the decisions that Tommy made. I think that right back position, you know, it's been a bit of a, an issue now for a couple of seasons, to be honest with you. Like, you know, everyone knows certainly my opinion on Charlie Fleming. And I know Jack Lynch was there in and out. Um, always did well there. But, you know, he was the last out in midfield then when he went there. And, uh, it's it's certainly a position that probably needs to be looked at. Um, Alec Byrne obviously is a really really big signing, you know, to get a full time professional player in from a Premier club, and and a young guy as well, a guy that has the first division medal in 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 his pocket, and it is a place I think we mentioned it even last week. Mm. Uh, there has been issues in the middle of the park. There was issues in the middle of the park last year. You know, you had Joe Joe Collins playing there, and you know, lots of times it didn't really work out with him, and you know, he was taken off and. I think, uh, in fairness to Lee David, he played well, had a couple of uh, strikes and certainly worked really hard. But it was kind of from the defensive side that he worked really hard, putting in tackles and tracking runners. And, you know, I just t- felt they were kind of over overworked in there. And um, we didn't really see a lot of them. We didn't see Colin Conroy or Lee David on the ball much in terms of getting it down and, and passing it. And uh, that's something probably that, that, that will need to be addressed. And I think Bray did very well today. You know, obviously, it's a season now after where Enda Kern has got 19 or 20 goals. And look, I'm sure before every match, there'll be a discussion about him. One of the things I thought that would work against, uh, or would work if you were marking him, would be to keep the, the defence nice and high and keep him away from the goals as much as you can. And I think Bray did that very well on, on Friday night. And you could see him getting very, very frustrated. It doesn't really suit him to be around the halfway line and maybe running in behind chasing balls. It's not his game. He's he's a much better player near near the opposition box. And I think they certainly limited his chances to to scraps and uh they certainly got rewarded for that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it was a big win for Bray at this point. And for Treaty, obviously, no time to dwell on that now, Noel. Um, just looking ahead to the Galway game, we've, we've mentioned it. We mentioned it with Bernie there earlier on. There's always a lot of bite between these clubs now, but just not just because of the crossover of player. The two managers seem to always be added on the sideline as well. And there's always some subplots going on uh, as well. Then you throw Ollie Horgan into the mix, and this is a real combustible element altogether, um, as seen by Ollie getting a yellow card on his return to Finn Park last week. Um, but I suppose just looking at the 3D team, Noel, Alec Byrne, if he's there with the squad this week, which you'd expect him to be, you'd imagine Tommy will look at it saying we'll probably throw him straight in uh, here. You got, Then you might free up Mark Walsh to play at centre-back, Ben O'Reardon to play at right-back, and maybe bring in Conor Barry into the central area where you were talking about as a number 10, and maybe have Stephen Christopher back out onto the wing where he has played for 3D. So even just with that one player to bring in, it does free up players to play in maybe more natural positions. I think it does, yeah. And look, Willie Armshaw is a guy who started a lot of games, particularly at the back end of last season. And um, I think it's important that, you know, and I think we would have brought this up before, like that you're not too defensive against Galloway. And when when we do play attacking players, like because they do get their full backs forward a lot. And if you have a couple of attacking players on the pitch, it keeps them preoccupied, if you like, with their with their primary role, which is, which is dealing with the uh, you know the attacking players of treaty and I think maybe you know I think he'd make a big difference and I I, I do think that maybe he isn't a bad idea at the start of the year you know to be nice and solid and play that experience and having you know the likes of Ben Reardon right back and Mark Walsh in 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 the middle I think Ant- Anto Don will be a bit better now with the game under his belt. And uh, certainly with a guy like Ali, Ali Byrne in the middle is, is a massive boost to Treaty, particularly with the loss of Ryan Connolly, you know, which was, you know, a bit out of the blue and didn't really give Tommy a lot of a lot of time and, you know, to get someone in of that calibre. And in to him, he, he has, albeit a younger lad, a guy that certainly has has the same potential. No, obviously it goes without saying uh, at AM and DC Park, which Treaty have found, despite being in the games all the time, um, you know, it's going to be incredibly difficult. Um, Galway got a very good win as well last week away to Finn Harps. I know Finn Harps are in the early stages of forming their side under under Dave Rogers, but we all know what uh, perils await you when you go to Finn Park and it looked fairly assured, although they did concede a, a very well, it looked a relatively soft penalty that, that Rob Slevin gave away uh, for Galway. Um, well, a big win nonetheless. Um, uh I suppose you still have Stephen Walsh playing up front uh, for Galway. Ed McCarthy did quite well in that game as well. And the new uh, central midfielder, Vincent Bordon, who kept Dave Hurley out of the starting team, got a, a double as well. Um, yeah, like it's, it's, I suppose, look, we just, as I said, it just goes without saying that we're not expecting Treaty to come away from him and DC uh, with the victory. The only thing about it is we've seen in the past that him and DC Park, in terms of the defensive structure of Treaty United, can suit them in terms of limiting Galway's chances too. Can look, I think Bernie made a great choice. Look, with all the Galway players that, that are in that squad now as well, they're obviously going to raise their game. And that's not to say that, that they don't put a, a good shift in every week. But look, we all know what it's like when you face your your former club. Maybe a few of them might feel that they should still be with the you know that club. And it really it really brings it, you know, down, it really tightens it up. Um treaty will be doubly determined now this week. Look, it's at the start of the season, all you really want to do is to get up up and running like, you know, I mean, I, I, if you probably said to them that they could have a point today, they'd probably take the hand off you, you know, but it is going to be a difficult night. Um, and uh, the, it's going to be a night maybe where they've, you know, they're going to do a lot of running again, if you like, like they did on Friday. Um, and there's a few bits that we don't really know, if, you know, how Alec Byrne is going to do or, or what kind of shape he's in. And uh, it's it's certainly a daunting task. And I think, um I tip Galway to do well. I think it is a big win for them. Um, they'll be very buoyant this week and, you know, they'll be determined to drive it on. You know, they're, they're carrying the pain of three years, I think, Bernie said, of, of, of playoff, playoff agony and um, they'll yeah. really be all out to, 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 to avoid the playoff route this year. Yeah, absolutely. And another one of those former 
Galway players who was in between the goalposts uh, last week for treaty was, was Connor Wynn and all. Um, without harping on about it too much, that that is obviously a problem position as we flagged in the in the first uh, part of the season with you know Ty Grime playing so well, Jack Brady playing so well the season after. We were always fairly assured of our goalkeeper. Um, we're not so much so the case now. Connor Wynn hasn't played League of Ireland football a lot at all in recent years. Um, you know it looked unsure at times. I felt against Bray, uh, even coming for one or two crosses, he didn't seem seem to, to get near them. Wasn't overly tested, obviously, on the night uh, in terms of shot stopping. Uh, but like you know, it, it is it is a concern uh, going forward. You'd imagine. Yeah, look, I mean, we got to give the guy a chance. Now, I think you're right. There was a couple of balls that he came from. Um, I think yeah, one of them was in the first half. Um, I thought overall his kicking was quite poor as well. Um, probably too many balls I felt went you know went out of play or certainly not in, in an area where you know where 3D are but look maybe they can tw- tweak those I think that's going to be important on Friday night because um the way Galway played there'll certainly be a lot of balls that's say uh, to be restarted and um you know they'll be looking at, at him as well maybe and seeing that you know they have an opportunity to to test him and they'll be looking to do that early on and you know you certainly don't want to go a goal down too early in that game um, because it, it certainly could be a very long night um, if, if you do Yeah absolutely although I will say one uh, maybe positive is that I think one of kind of wins best performances for Treaty if not the best was in a nil all draw at AM and DC Park last year against Galway probably up this game as, as well as, as Bernie was saying uh, for that game so hopefully that will continue uh, on Friday night I know it was a I suppose a blistering opening night. We we mentioned the attendances, which we we'll talk about again. Um, look at Ferry Carrick Park. It was absolutely bouncing. Um, I, I think it was the cup final that you were involved in yourself. Was it against Derry where there was the last uh, attendance anywhere near that in in Ferry Carrick Park against Derry? Um, there was a light show, fireworks display, uh, welcoming the two teams out into the pitch. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of fireworks in terms of the performance from Wexford by all accounts on the night with Washim Oshria getting a hat trick and um, what looked like two goalkeeping errors, really soft goals. Uh, scored by Waterford as well. Look, I know it's the first night, so you'll certainly be hoping that close. I think it was just under two thousand were at Ferry Carrick Park, so you'd be hoping that the, the public will will stick with it in in Wexford uh, a, a bit longer than the, that result suggests. Yeah, I don't look. It's obviously be disappointing to lose three 0 but I think a lot of you know. I mean, again, maybe what Tommy will be touching on. It'll be the games against against Treaty and you know the, the teams that will be around them. That'll be the ones that are going to be important. Um, obviously you want to get off to a good start. But look, in fairness, the there was always a good hardcore group of Wexford youth um supporters in my time as well. And obviously not two thousand only for the for the likes of uh when we played Wolves and and Derry. But um, they'll probably stick it out for another while and look probably have a core of of a good side. I think their goalkeeper. Could be an issue for them as well. Um, it just shows you this, the kind of tightness around the league in terms of of, of goalkeepers. You only have to look at Cork City signing a, a goalkeeper from Celtic um, for their Premier League season. So, um, but look, they'll be um, they'll get going, and I'm sure they'll be there thereabouts in that fifth or sixth or seventh position, and there'll be some really good games there. Yeah, absolutely. A, a really good start for, uh, for Waterford, as we expected, to be fair, who take on uh, Longford. Uh, the, obviously, another big night as well in Mount Hawk Park, Noel, uh, with Kerry FC uh, playing their first ever uh, League of Ireland game against Cove. Cove came out with the victory. We do, obviously, as we said, expect Cove to be much stronger um, this year than they were last year. That wouldn't be too difficult, uh, considering how bad a year it was for Cove uh, last season. But uh, a good start for them and a good start for Jack Doherty, who had an assist and a goal uh, in Kerry as well. Yeah, look, it's it's a, a good win for Cove, I think, because, you know, those games can be very tricky. Um, I remember actually our first home game in Wexford Jutes in, you know, seven or eight was was a home game on a Sunday against Cove. And, you know, we came out 2-1 winners. Um, we didn't win a lot of games after that. But... Uh, I think it was a, it was a good test to Cove. Um, there'll probably be some easier wins down in Kerry, you know, later on in the season. And um, they look like they're certainly up and running now, and they have the three points. So it'll be interesting to see how they go in 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 the next few weeks. Yeah, probably the I suppose the the main shock of the of the weekend was at Lone Town going to Longford and overturning Longford three one in the Midlands Derby. I suppose. It, 
not an unbelievable shock because we do expect Longford maybe not to be as strong as they were uh, last season, Noel. Um, but obviously, at Lone have been written off to be in the bottom two uh, in most quarters, probably just ahead of, of Kerry, Kerry FC. But Francois Perrault, who actually, Noel, was uh, sent off for a second booking when he took his top over his head. He didn't even take his top off fully and the referee gave him a second booking. Um, but he got two goals for Athlone. Uh, a really good confidence-boosting win for Athlone. That's the second time they've done that in, in the the back, uh, sorry, the home ground of their main rivals. Yeah, and to think, I think, was it how many games did they play last year before before yeah. they got a win? I think it was 10 or 11 games, I think, before they got a win. So look, they'll be buoyed up by that. They're obviously kind of a Cosmopolitan group, I think, is is how you describe them. Um, there hasn't been a huge amount of investment there. From what I'm hearing, that at loan <clears throat> board, if you like, are putting more money into the women's side of it because I think it's easier to get success or easier to you know to get to cup final and and to be near top of the league. And they know that you know, even if they do get to the top of the league in the first division. It's going to be difficult to you know to stay in the Premier, but uh, they're certainly going to be a bit more competitive than they were last year, and it only adds to the intrigue of 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 